the, the link that you've got here is on the E Electronic Foundation FF website, <laughs> according to their logo. <laughs> um, uh, you know, so the EFF oh, yeah. are obviously... Electronic, uh, <laughs> e Electronic <laughs> Foundation FF. That is what it says. Chris Waddle. Listeners and everything before this will, I'm sure, get cut out. Cut out. So, welcome to episode 44, season two of Bad Voltage. Uh, how the sausage is made. Uh, I missed the last show, so I, I imagine 43 was was one of the worst shows in the in the history of the show. Uh, and actually, no. A lot of times when I miss the show, I'll be honest, I get busy and I forget and I don't listen to it. I listened to this one. You, all three of you, did an absolute fantastic job. Ah. Uh, thanks, thanks, Popey, for uh, for filling in there. And thank you, Popey. Yes, thank you very much. We always enjoy having him on there. So uh, I do want to, at some point, have both Jeremy and Popey on, so we can dispel I this. I heard your quip at the end there. Rumor. We have been seen in the same room, I believe. Right. <laughs> this, this, there is a growing. There is a growing rumor by primarily flat Earth people uh, that they are the same person. So. <laughs> a, a fascinating um, overlap there. So, uh, but we're going to do a whole show of news again, because that's what we do. Um, so, Jeremy, given the fact that you, uh, frankly, um, reneged on your responsibilities last time, do you want to yes. kick us off? Sure. On that fine and now bad voltage note, I will, I will kick things off. <laughs> and since it's been a month, there's a ton of news, so I almost don't even know what to pick. But since this is right. a topic that I have uh, expounded on previously on many occasions, let's go with the... The latest on messages, Allo, Duo, and Hangouts post by Google over there. Uh, so for those of you who have not heard me just kind of rage about the current state of, of Google messaging, they have seven messaging apps. For those of you who aren't in the Android ecosystem, that's messages, Google Allo, Google Voice, Google Duo, Hangouts, Hangouts Chat, not to be confused with Hangouts Meet. So what this post basically said that uh, Google Allo will be going away in March that was their smart messaging app, which I, to be honest, installed for one minute, checked it out, and then uninstalled. Um, so they're going to be focusing. Well. Yeah, they're they're going to be focusing on messages now, which is their standard app, while still keeping Google Voice, which is their voice app. Uh, Google Duo will continue to be their uh, video app, and Google Chat and Google or Hangouts Chat and Hangouts Meet will continue to be their G Suite kind of enterprise focused stuff. Still not sure what they're doing with Hangouts. They say they're end of lifing it. They say they're not end of lifing it. Uh, I, I really can't tell what they're doing there. It seems like right. they can't tell. So, A, uh, curious what you think of, of this whole... I, all three of us are Android users, so uh, yes. are somewhat in the ecosystem at least. What do, you, what do you think of all this? By the way, just before we go on to the opinions, I have to say, so there was uh, this guy, Ron Amadeo, who uh, wrote, uh, wrote this up on Ask Technica, Wrote it with the headline. I love this. Google, to simplify messaging strategy, will support only five messaging apps. <laughs> yes. Ro Rockers Which I think Amadaya. says everything. <laughs> yeah. What do you think, Akam, about this? Um, this is what we wanted them to do, and they've done it. Well done, Google. We said, uh, why do you create Allo? It's pointless it. and stupid. They went, goodness, the Bad Voltage team are correct and have canned <laughs> Allo. What, the thing I don't get, I mean, Jeremy, you at least installed it. I, I didn't even install As far as I could tell, Allo was dead on delivery. Right? It's like going out during the Black Plague and buying a front door with a red X already on it. Nobody <laughs> used it. I don't know anyone who even... <laughs> Tried to contact me on it or anything. Who who even used it? I don't. Google Plus users. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure who used it. I I believe, and this seems to be a lot of the problem with with Google messaging specifically, but other parts of Google too is the the way they structure their promotions and how you get executive uh, buy-in and, and, and executive attention seems to 
really for the last few years be predicated on you getting like a cool shiny thing. So it tends to push people to put on their OKRs a lot of things that I don't think are generally useful but sound yeah. cool. And I think Allo is one of those things. So it got a lot of attention. Uh, I don't know what a smart messaging app is, which is how they pitched it. Uh, also, when it says we're we're putting quote unquote the most loved features into messages, and then they list them, it's smart replies, gifs, and desktop support. So, smart reply is not useful. I, the fact that gifs is one of the top three things tells you a lot about the app. And desktop support, welcome, welcome to ten years ago. So, congratulations yeah. for finally baking that in. Awesome. Exactly. I, I, there I don't were, know there were two critical points about that. The first one is it's a fucking gif. But it's a second, gif. It's not a gif. <laughs> but the, right, second, the second point, right? And I'm hearing no word against it, Jezza, right? Fucking J- Jeremy Jarcia, shut up. It's, it's a yeah, gif. It's lemon flavored messaging. Okay. <laughs> but <laughs> the smart replies thing. I've found myself being seduced into using them in Gmail, and I feel slightly oh, dirty every I time use, I do it. Use and it worse, all the time. I feel slightly dirty when I get a response back from someone which clearly was a smart reply. I feel quite hard done by, like, they didn't really care about my email. I've resisted the siren song of using them, to be honest. It, it is shocking how often... It's really, really close to what I would actually have replied with, but I still type it out and and use these slightly different. The, mo- you are the a moment ridiculous human being. The the <laughs> moment I went, you know what? I'm fighting my lonely battle against the war machine pointlessly. Is when I saw the smart replies. Went, I'm not going to use a smart reply, and then typed in that sounds great, which was just there in a button, and I t- it was word for word what I was going to say, and I thought. Okay, this is a pointless stand you are taking, language. Stop doing it and just use the buttons when they're... It's startling how often it's... I don't know whether that's because brilliant AI or just because I'm super predictable and so is the rest of humanity. That All we want to say is, that sounds great. See you at the weekend. Let's go with (laughs) a little of column A and a little of column B. Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> no, I, I, I feel it's the same reason why I still uh, write a smiley face like an original, like old school ASCII. Yes. Um, <laughs> I, 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 and if, I, if, if anyone ever sees a smiley face emoticon from me, it's because the app did it for me. Yep. Um, yeah. I, I don't believe in. I don't believe I have ever emoji. explicitly picked a smiley face emoji. Anytime you've seen one from me, it's because it got replaced. And I, I hate it when it does that and wish they yeah. pack it in. We are. Uh, there's no doubt that we've become old men. I know. Uh, we're just we're just cantankerous old curmudgeons. It's terrible. <laughs> speak for yourself. Although I have to, I have to say, typing in the thing that it suggested anyway it's is a funny. special kind of. <laughs> Cantankerousness, I, I, is that the I, word? I don't do it anymore. I did it one time and realized it was stupid, so I have now stopped. <laughs> yeah, good, but, good for you. Do, They are surprisingly but, handy, though, do, particularly for people who don't want to type on mobiles. But yeah, so. do you but, not feel a little bit cheated when you get a response back to an email which was obviously just a smart reply? No, he uses that I've, thing where he has Google... Uh, act like an assistant and screen calls for people. So the answer to your question is no. I I, I feel cheated. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the thing I, is, um, oh, go ahead. I was just going to say, uh, I honestly have never noticed, not once. Uh, I've never even thought about it until you mentioned it. Whether I may have got some automated wow or something that pissed someone's legs. Because this, maybe the thing maybe the maybe all your correspondents just just respond to you with bland, meaningless, nonsensical one-word sentences <laughs> anyway, and so it hasn't changed. <laughs> well, the thing is, is that it's not like I mean, like if I reply to someone and then Google suggests it, right? I'm still. It's still what I want to say. It's not like I'm just saying, okay, Google, just respond to that, and I'll have nothing to do with it. That'd be very different. But the fact that I'm approving that, oh, well, I, oh, fucking hell, I was going to say that anyway, Google. You're very clever, aren't you? You know? It's not so sophisticated to start randomly making Axe FX comments, <laughs> right? Oh, I don't know. I mean, this, is what, this is what integrating your ad buys is for, right? Right, so, Jeremy, for the rest of this show, we have to respond to all Jono's things with a thing that sounds like a Google quick reply. <laughs> sounds good. 
<laughs> uh, the, the thing, going back, back to the topic a little bit, the thing that I think is, is interesting to me here is how important messaging is to an ecosystem like Android and how uh, bungled yeah. their response and overall strategy here has been. I mean, I, I really like Android, obviously want to see Android succeed. Uh, this getting better is important to me because I use Android every day. So I'm, I'm curious to see if this will kind of rein things in and, and be a realization internally. Uh, whether that changes the, the one thing. So Scott Johnson, uh, who's a, a product guy over at Google tweeted, I run hangouts and this is pretty shoddy reporting. And he's referring to the nine to five Google article, which is the yes. one that I first saw. Uh, no decision has been made about when hangouts will be shut down. Hangout users will be upgraded to hangouts chat and hangouts meet your source is severely misinformed. You can do better to which he was met with a cacophony of you can do better with your messaging strategy. That tweet is garbage. <laughs> <laughs> I found personally entertaining. Feel a little bad for Scott, but um, well, here's, um, perhaps he'll on, get the on, message. On the subject of meet, um, I have noticed now that when people book uh, meetings in Google Calendar and they and they schedule a video call in it, it's they've quietly become meet calls now. Apart yes. from ones which were booked ages ago, like this very thing in our calendars has still got an old-fashioned Google Hangouts link because we booked it, you know, five years ago <laughs> and told it right. to schedule a video call, and so it keeps right. the old one. But if you book a new one now, it's just quietly a meet link now. But as far as I can tell, it, it just works. What, so I, I started using G Suite about about a year ago, actually, um, and uh, and it's always come with me. So was G, did G Suite previously come with – was it just Hangouts, I'm guessing? Yes, Okay, because um, all of my meetings with my clients are all me, because that's just what's in okay. in Google Calendar. So um, yeah, but- yeah. I mean, I don't know. I mean, the thing is, as well as the thing that strikes me is the most interesting or the most useful. Well, the two most useful and relevant messaging things that have occurred in the last four or five years for me personally, and I think I'm a pretty typical Google user in this regard is uh, one is the or the smart replies thing. I think that's incredibly useful if you don't want to type too much. I hate typing on phones, right? So it's very useful for that. But secondly, is the fact that I can actually now reply to texts uh, in my browser, right? So this is something that iMessage has had for many, many years. Yes. You know, Erica would constantly reply to people on her computer, and it was very, very handy. Um and that only really has been around for Android for a short well, period of time. Hang on. I can't do that. Sure How do SMSs, which get sent to your phone number, end up in your Google, end up in the Google ecosystem at all? Well, no. So I'm talking, if you go to messages.android.com, yep. right, and then use your messaging app on your phone and scan the QR code, there's an option in your phone to... I forget what it is to connect to messages oh, web or something. Oh, the point is, you've set it up so an app on your phone receives an SMS over the phone network and then sh- and then shuttles it off to Google so it's available to you. Right, that's fine then. I thought Android right. was just like randomly pirating all my SMS messages and going, "Now you can deal with them in the Google Cloud." No, no, no. no. So, right, you've set the, you've set the, that up. But that's fine then. Okay. But that being able to do that to me is like such a basic thing, mm-hmm. and I still, honestly, to this day. I honestly have no idea what Allo is or Duo. I don't know what they do. I don't know how they're different. And it's, it's, it reminds me of Google Wave. I looked at Google Wave and I was like, that sounds really cool. What is it? What, is it, what does it do? <laughs> yeah. So they, it, just seems, it seems like tech companies, what happens is they get to a certain size and they, they build things primarily for, you know, they understand their audience. And then what happens, I think the same thing has happened with other companies. And then when they get to a certain size and they need to keep differentiating and find the next big win, they basically keep throwing things out until they try and find something. And I think a lot of tech companies don't know enough about the audience that they don't have. Right. I had this conversation with a friend of mine who works at GitHub, where a lot of people who work at GitHub, wonderful people, but they think everything lives in a pull request. They think the pull request is the center of gravity for everything. And, uh, and they didn't realize that, you know, in like traditional Windows enterprise shops, GitHub is not particularly well known, right? It's uh, the idea of a pull request is kind of unusual or certainly how it operates in, in GitHub. So the, the concept of a pull request isn't particularly well known in all technology circles. And I think you see a similar thing here where Google throw out all these different messaging apps, but how much of the general public actually needs a lot of these things? 
So I, I I think I don't know whether this is the case or not, but if you've got lots of different companies in an ecosystem all pursuing the same kind of goal, what you tend to get is a lot of apps where eighty percent of the app is a clone of the same eighty percent of everybody else's app, and people just try and differentiate a little bit on top because right. they have no choice, right? If if you want to build something against someone else's got um against someone else's product, so you want to do roughly the same thing, you've got to spend a whole bunch of your time re-implementing stuff they're already doing because you want different products i don't know if google are trying to run projects internally in competition with one another out of some notion that this will make them all better and competition raises all boats and all that kind of thing and so instead of saying we've had some cool ideas for smart messaging let's put them in the messaging app that's like oh that belongs to the messaging app team and they don't have to listen to me so i will go to the people at the top and go we should have a different product which does messaging so they re-implement half of the messaging infrastructure possibly making it better on the way and then build their new bit on top as a different product Act as if they're a different company. Yes, they do. Rather kind of than and you, you can together. kind of see the trajectory of this social team internally getting a lot of sway and then losing that sway by the other products they release. Yeah, right. But it's like the open source problem. We have too many frameworks. Let's create another framework to solve the problem of too many frameworks. What are yeah, the greatest I mean, XKCDs <laughs> ever? I mean, do you remember how it used to be 15 years ago with mail clients on Linux? How there were loads and loads and loads and loads of mail clients, and each one had kind of one feature that made it cool, and the other 80% of it was the same as everybody else's. And so everyone was missing one thing that made it useful. You know, it didn't do CCs or something, or it didn't do spell checking (laughs) or something like that. Because they were all spending all their time implementing the basic stuff the whole time rather than getting together and collaborating because yes. if you contribute to someone else's product you don't get all the credit all right yep and if it was the last case inside I, I, google a bit i can feel our audience have become bored by this topic <laughs> despite the fact that we're interested in it we are, so we should probably move on we are really interested in it um okay um i'll do one uh yes. microsoft uh, with their Edge browser, have finally bitten the bullet and said, yeah, we're not going to do that. And so they're basing it on Chrome. So why is this interesting? I get that, you know, it, it, this long legacy of Microsoft trying to do their own browser. Is that it? Or is there something else that's interesting? Because this just seems like a very boring... So I, um, you, you I, genuinely don't think this is interesting? No. Oh, wow. I mean, I, I suspected Eck would bring this one up. He is a web guy. Yeah, uh, I think it's yeah. interesting. Why? But I'll let... Invite, uh, Ed, explain to me why it's interesting. There are a couple of reasons why, in my opinion. The first one is it's a radical change in Microsoft policy. I mean, whether you can see it, see it as a good thing, they're prepared to embrace something they didn't build for such a fundamental component of their operating system, or you see it as a bad thing that they're no longer fighting the fight and they've just ceded all that ground to google it's certainly an interesting move on their part it's it's more evidence of the for the thing that we've talked about quite a lot over the last year or so that microsoft are not the same microsoft they used to be right Right. but the second reason i think is interesting is now there is basically only one browser engine the only major third-party implementation now is firefox yeah, and I think that's and, and, and they're deal. not that, and they're not that big a deal anymore, and that's interesting because there's a bunch of stuff. Uh, it, it's it's quite handy for everyone to be running essentially the same web browser under the covers because then you don't have to worry about some sites not working in your browser of choice and what have you. But we've been through the whole one company controls most of the web browsers thing with Microsoft yeah. and IE, and yeah. what it led to is stagnation and no competition. Now, Google are a lot better now than Microsoft were then, certainly, because Google wanted the web to succeed and Microsoft wanted it to die. But it's still concerning because Google have our interests at heart for a bunch of stuff, but not everything. I mean, to give you, pick an example, right? We're starting to see various... Um, uh, first-party browsers on platforms integrate things like uh, ad blocking and privacy protection, right? Firefox do it. iOS Safari does it. If everyone's using the same browser, it makes sense to put it in the core, right? But can you see Google allowing ad blocking technology to be built right into the center of Blink so everyone gets it by default? Yes. And that's the kind of thing that concerns me about there being one browser engine 
and everyone just uses it is when there's a useful idea which the controlling company doesn't like. Yeah, but I think this is not exactly a new thing that we've seen with open source. And I think what we're going to see is if 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 that company abuses its will, it, it, its influence, um, <clears throat> then it will be forked. Uh, and with so many companies involved in it, I think that there will be... I mean, there's there's many companies involved, but rel- relatively few people companies building browsers, right? It's not yeah. like Linux, where lots and lots of people contribute to Linux and it's deployed in many many different scenarios. Um, yes, agreed. But p- part of the reason why I don't think this is particularly interesting is I just don't think that Edge is a particularly big of my, part of Microsoft's well, strategy, and I and I and and Microsoft has demonstrated that they're that they they've been changing significantly. So if this was if this had happened 5 years ago it'd be enormous news. But I think the fact that it's happened today to me it's just like okay, fair enough. Uh see, like, no I think I think it's interesting how long they stuck with Edge uh, to only get roughly what 6% or something of the market, how much money they dumped into it. But I I think to X point, the fact that they didn't just end of life Edge, but basically said we're going with the engine written by one of our biggest competitors is such a shift in their mentality that that piece alone is interesting to me. But the fact that I I think this increases the irrelevance of Firefox also is significant to me. So it's, I think, significant in two totally unrelated ways and interesting. I I, I would have loved to see Microsoft say, yeah, okay, we're not going to continue developing Edge HTML. Um, We're going to base Edge on Gecko instead. Why? Why would they do that? um, Because... They're not. They're not. Uh, for, uh, Mozilla aren't a major competitor of theirs. Um, this is the same reason we talked in the last. Oh. This, we talked in the last oh. show about how Samsung are doing a whole bunch of work on products that aren't really going anywhere, so they have a hedge if Google decide to change Android in a way that Samsung don't like. They have to do this work because they can't afford to cede all the ground on the direction of their operating system to one of their big competitors. I'm surprised Microsoft would do the same, as Jeremy says. But the thing is, though, is that Blink, I mean, Blink has had contributions from not just Google, right? There's Opera, there's Adobe, there's Intel, there's Samsung. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it powers Brave. Like, it's not like, I, I think maybe we're see, I think you guys are seeing too much of a correlation between Google and Blink. I mean, there's no doubt that Google, like Blink is in, incorporated into a browser that's most well-known, the most well-known browser that is very directly associated with Google. But it's not like Google doesn't have a good reputation working as an open source, like with open source projects as a general rule. Yeah. No, I mean, I, 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 and, I Android, say, Android is, is a bit different. Yeah. This is, Android not, the, is not particularly open source. Yeah. This is not, you know, the end of the world. I've, uh, the reason I, uh, the reason I mostly thought it was interesting as Jeremy says, is that this is an unusual move for Microsoft. I think not, not necessarily because, you know, that, um, because it's surprising to see them work with open source or anything, because increasingly it isn't. But they've always been a company who believed very much in them having control over the stuff they're shipping. And right. stepping away from that's a pretty big deal for them. Maybe I'm just not getting it. Yeah, no. <laughs> Fair play. <laughs> Well, there you go. I mean, I s- and, and, and as you say, you know, it's got like, you know, 1% of the market. If that, it doesn't even show up in most people's lists. So who the right. hell cares? The one thing that, 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 that I am curious about is why they're even still making a browser. Like, if it's just not generating the returns that they that, that I think they're wanting to see, and then they're based... I mean, a browser, uh, this is going to be what? a horrible simplification, and I know a lot of people are going to shout at me for saying this, but as far as I'm concerned, like, when I open up a browser, all I care about is the rendering engine. I care that it shows me websites. I don't care about bookmarks. I don't care about half the shit that comes with browsers today. The reason why Chrome works for me is because it is integrated into uh, into Google services. So therefore, some of my, hi- like my history and stuff like that is there, which is useful. But outside of that, I think this is where Firefox has struggled. They've been trying to differentiate away from something such as Chrome, and I think they've struggled to do so because I think most people just want a browser to show bloody web pages. That's it. The reason the reason they're building a browser as opposed to building a rendering engine is they've got to ship a browser with Windows, and they're not going to ship Chrome because they have to pay Google money every time they did it. Right, but they could ship Firefox. Yes, they could. That's and, what I'm and saying. And I would have liked but, to see them do that, and they aren't doing right. it. <laughs> 
So that's, that, but that's why I don't understand. There's got to be a reason, and I'm assuming the reason for it is because <coughs> they. I'm assuming it's somewhat tied to potentially tied to Bing, maybe in some way. I don't well, know. I, I, anyway. um, there's also a bunch of stuff around. I suspect they would like it if it was integrated with the Windows key ring and stuff like that. And so it gets tighter integration into the Windows OS, which they could do better than anybody else because you know, check it out. They built it. Yeah. And yeah. in order to do that, there, there's not necessarily the desire on the part of third-party browsers to do all that tight integration. The Chrome people don't want you to integrate tightly with the operating system. They want you to treat Chrome as the operating system. So they're yes. much more keen on giving you trivial password inc- um, synchronization and integration into Google's cloud, not into your platform. Microsoft obviously yeah. don't want that because if they put Chrome on everyone's machine, then they're just seeding all of their customers' ongoing revenue and services signups and so on to Google, which they clearly don't want to do. Heads, build, yeah, heads, yeah, heads yeah. building a browser. Now, admit that they don't need to build the rendering engine to do that, and this is why they're making this move, I suspect. You know, why are we spending all this time constantly playing catch-up? And Edge is still behind on a whole bunch of stuff. I ran into a thing like this week, which Edge doesn't do it. I was really annoyed about it. Yeah. No, I agree. Well, I have a suggestion yeah, for another thing. topic. Next thing. So um, um, let me just pull up the show notes. Hang on. Uh, so NASA's Insight uh, landed on Mars. Yeah. Uh, this was the this was the latest craft to be shot in the uh, general direction of Mars, and it landed. And I believe that this was primarily focused on. Um, exploring the inside of the of the planet and um, learning more about Mars quakes, um, which are obviously earthquakes on Mars. Um, apparently, there is this. What I oh, thought yeah, was interesting I about this because earthquakes are quite, yeah, and we thought about right. that, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Good point. <laughs> what, what I thought was interesting was, you know, they have this. Um, the, the, they have this like seven minutes of terror. They call it, which is. There's, the, there's like a gap where they basically don't that where mission control don't have any information available to them about how it's doing and they basically sit there and shit themselves solidly for seven minutes and then they can determine whether this you know years and years of work and and planning and preparation and everything has been successful or whether it's just another piece of junk that's going to be floating around the universe and it was successful and um it's. Uh, I just think it's really neat that we're seeing this kind of stuff happening. What was really cool was there's this like there's this video of when it clearly landed properly, and these people in mission control do this crazy like high fiving thing. Yeah. Did you see that? I, I watched it. I watched it live as it was happening. Yeah. Oh, five you did? years work. Cool. Five years. Five years work. Six months of worrying. Seven minutes of utter punch shitting panic and then it landed on Mars. <laughs> I mean, the, what, the what six was... plus months travel is awesome. The fact that in those seven minutes it goes from 12,000 miles an hour to like five miles an hour, just everything involved to have this actually work is, is just awesome. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the thing as well that I would encourage everyone who, uh, who is listening to this t- to check out, there's a video on youtube uh and it's it was part of nat geo live it's called the curious life of a mars mars Ro- rover and uh, i'll add it to the show notes so maybe you can put it into, yeah. into the into the into the show notes and basically it's this guy who worked on um i think it was curiosity uh, and hang on let me just add this so i don't forget um and it, it, it basically walks through all of the preparation and planning that they had to go to and how they basically have this thing land and it is absolutely mind-blowing it's only 25 minutes long it's worth every second i encourage everyone to go and check it out and it puts like something like insight really into perspective because i think for a lot of us we think okay you shot something and it went to mars okay that's cool but all we really know is that mars is a planet that's a long way away and we got something on there but when you actually see the engine, engineering that went into it, it's it's absolutely phenomenal. So good it, work. It's a lot NASA. of work. Well, one of the things that interests me is um, we've all been to scale a bunch of times, Southern California, yes. Southern California Linux Expo, uh, and that's in Pasadena in California. And yep. also in Pasadena is JPL, NASA's Jet Propulsion right. Lab, which is where they build all this stuff. So yep. yes. next time I'm at scale, I would quite like – to, I don't I don't know if they do tours or anything, but they just let me just go walk, walk around and just poke Pathfinder or what have you. Um, but <laughs> but 
He's like, oh, that, that, that looks really good. Very impressive. Um, all these people wandering around going, I know all about this. You go, did you learn it from somewhere other than The Martian? And they go, shut up. <laughs> but <laughs> but I, don't, I don't know if they do tours or anything, but I quite like to go out to JPL because it's JPL. I mean, this is hallowed ground, right? It'd oh, be absolutely. cool. It's pretty cool. Yeah, very cool. Yeah, it, it, is, it is very cool. It's just, it, it's, I, I love seeing stuff like this because it just... You know, we talk about technology every on every show, obviously, in Bad Voltage, and we operate in a very specific area, right, in software. And we touch on hardware a little bit here and there, but this stuff <laughs> that NASA does is just a whole world of difference. Oh, the, yeah. the amount of I, just, just bonkers engineering work that goes into this is... Yeah, and, and the whole, don't worry about Mind it, we'll just, we'll just release a beta and then ship all the fixes in the update doesn't work when you're on another planet. <laughs> right. Well, did you see <laughs> right. uh, every command takes 12 and a half minutes to get there? That yeah. alone is just mind-blowing. I know. It's, I know. It's nuts. It's oh. like, yeah, it's like the old days of computers, right? When, you know, punch cards and everything where, you know, running an instruction was, a, you have to think carefully about it. Yeah, it right, takes right. a while. You, you spend the whole weekend sitting there sketching it out on bits of paper before you do it because you knew you'd have to wait a week for the response, you know? <laughs> you, yeah. you hear all these it's, stories of people from the early days of computing who didn't have their own computer because they, you know, there were six, like Thomas J. Watson said, but they would give you time on them so you could sit down and write out a program and send it off to them and say, some bloke in a white coat would type it into the computer and then print out its results and send them back to you in the post. You know, it's like how yeah. Stallman deals with the web. <laughs> <laughs> I think the closest our generation have got to that uh, is, I remember when I was a kid and uh, for my birthday, my parents bought me one of these books that was available in computer shops where it would, you, where you could make a game and it was just basically a printout of of, of source compu- Commodore sixty four source code, and you'd, you'd your family would sit there and take it in turns typing it in. <laughs> that was um, there, there, there was a magazine called Input is a, uh, could be the one you're thinking. Input, yeah, could be the one yeah. you're thinking of. Which interestingly, um, not only um, Bill, friend of the show, actually got them all and has still got the binders. I think that they came in, but oh, um, really, the whole collection of Input is now on archive.org. There's oh, cool. a, there's a um, there's a huge collection of computer magazines from the 80s and early 90s, which have all been scanned in and put on archive.org, and you can just read them. There's a there's a there's a Twitter bot which just randomly tweets pages from them, and it's fascinating. Oh, wow. what's the? Do you know the name of the bot? I want to um, I want to check that out. R- remind me, and I will dig it out. I don't know it off the top of my head. I'm subscribed to it, so I'll, I'm going to put a note in the show notes saying find the Twitter bot for computer magazines. A show note. What a note. mountain Very of meta. information. Yeah. Every everybody's getting. Although I don't getting know who you were taking turns with. My family didn't operate like that. Also, that story from you was the equivalent of, when I was your age, computers were a nickel. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, is, it, is, it is sadly true. Um, what's, what's next? What's next? Uh, you next, Jeremy. Sure. Why don't we go with, did you see that uh, global U.S. growth in smartphones has actually started to decline, which this is the first time for this. Uh, in 2007, now that all the you know numbers and everything's finalized in different quarters, whatever, uh, they sold less cell phones than in 2016. First time that it was, it was ever down year over year like that. And it's not only plateaued pretty hard since 2014 in general, but growth is... It went from 62-ish percent in 11 down to, you know, mid-20s in 14, down to 2% in 16, and, and now is point, negative 0.3, so not hugely negative, but negative nonetheless. And I think this is for a couple of reasons. I think, you know, it's the we're kind of hitting, I think, the stage of ubiquity in market saturation with cell phones. Very few people, especially in, in a country like the U.S. or the U.K., don't have one. But beyond that, they're really losing their wow factor a little bit. I think they really are becoming more of a commodity. And because of that, people are just finding less reason to replace or upgrade, and those upgrade cycles are getting longer as phones are getting better in general. So I'm curious what what you think of this, A, but B, where we go from here and, and kind of what's next in the There's cycle. nothing else to do. I mean, people that I told you, real people, not us, are like, well, what do I need What do I need a new phone for? This one does everything I need to and 40 billion other things I don't need it to. Yeah. What What would be the point in buying another one? This is, we're all, um, 
plus the fact that people are now starting to think, well, people are buying phones less often, so we better start charging more money for them to keep our profit margin up, which means phones are now £1,000, which means that then you go back around the loop and people are even less inclined to buy them. So the next thing we're going to see is the industry continue to cannibalise itself with planned obsolescence, I think. I, I think the $1,000 cell phone has had the opposite effect long term that they wanted in that when cell phones were $400 or $500, I think replacing them, people didn't think, a lot of people didn't think twice about it. They thought, oh, something cool is out. That's new. I'm going to buy it. When you have invested $1,000, you now think, do I want to get rid of this thing I spent $1,000 on for a new thing that's $1,000? And a lot of times the answer is just no. And this is the thing I spent $1,000 on 18 months ago. And, and right. I think what's one thing, uh, observation here, I, I have espoused the wonders of the essential phone many times now and uh, was curious with the Pixel 3, so I bought it, not the XL giant phablet version nonsense, uh, just the, the regular <laughs> Pixel 3. And I think it's this a great is the phone that you said, this is the phone that you said in a previous show was garbage and you would never buy one. Is that this? Are we talking about the same phone? I never said that about the Pixel. <laughs> You said it. you you did you had particularly un, unimpressed words to say about the Pixel Three. Uh, so I don't think like, I can't see why anyone would buy good. one of these. Um, I I bought it predominantly for the phone because I thought the I'm sorry for the phone for the uh, camera because I thought it was uh, uh, by far the best camera on the market right now. It is a great um, camera. Yeah, I think this is the first time though that I got a new phone and I, it's not markedly better than the Essential in any way that I can tell. And right. the essentials over a year old and now only $300 new. So you could buy, you know, three and a half of them for the price of the pixel. I mean, the, the battery life on the pixel isn't really any better. The, the camera itself is a lot better, but you lose the 360 aspect. So I'll, I guess I'll consider that a wash. Uh, but it really is the first time that I went from flagship phone to flagship phone and thought, I, I don't know what I'm getting here. I think you're right. I think the, the, the difference is becoming more and more nuanced. And I think what's in, now what's happening is I think we're starting to see phone makers really struggling to ax point to figure out ways to make it interesting. So you're getting these things like foldable smartphones or an idea that people have gotten and, you know, all of these ways of trying to get around the like this obsession about the notch is just stupid. Like who gives a shit? Like if, <laughs> if you're the kind of person who obsesses over, over the, whether you have a notch or whether you don't have enough, get a life. Who cares? It's a <laughs> tiny proportion of a phone. Like, there are way bigger things to deal with in life, right? The way bigger things that everybody can spend their time, energy, effort, and, and intelligence on than worrying about a tiny proportion of a phone screen. Who cares, right? So, the, so you know, now we're starting to see these phones, I think, jump in the shark. I think that what part of the reason that, that, we're seeing this, that, that we're seeing this decline is for what you guys have said, but and, and the pricing element... But what's interesting to me is that if you look at the data for um, internet usage and internet growth, that has been consistently growing um, in the developed world since, well, f in forever. There was a slight drop around 2004. But um, in, the in the developing world, we've seen internet growth growing and growing consistently since really 1998 sort of time. So I think the world is becoming more and more connected. If we're seeing a drop in smartphone growth, I suspect the reason for that is because they're getting too expensive um, or there isn't, enough, there isn't enough innovation. They've become commoditized. And I think that's why we're starting to see things like the Pixel Lite becoming more and more of a thing. Like in the developed world, in the West, you don't want the, you, you want the flagship, right? Everyone talks about the flagship because phones are a social component of how we tend to live. But yeah. I think if you live in a developing nation, they're pure utility for a lot of people. I... Uh, not for everybody. You still have those social dynamics in developing nations too. But I think for a lot of people, they're pure ut utility. And I think companies are going to try and figure out ways to tap into that. I don't necessarily think that they're pure utility. I think there's just as much, um, just as much of a, uh, of a social component to the phone you purchase um, all over the world. It's just that you're not going to spend a thousand pounds, which is, uh, you know, four months' wages on a phone. Well, I mean, I, I, I mean, I'm I, sure, I'm, I'm sure you'd be cock of the walk if you had a Pixel Three, in some of these places. But you know, you can't afford it. Well, what I mean, but like I say, I do think there is that social component in, in, in many developing nations, but I'm guessing that 
and I have no data to back this up, but I'm guessing that it's not quite as profound as it is in a lot of Western nations. I'm I'm, I'm prepared to believe that there aren't as many people um, slashing one another to death in the school playground over the minute details of the phone you've got, no. But then um, they're probably not the same about trainers either. (laughs) <laughs> yeah yeah exactly and, 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 and i'll be honest with you i suspect it's worse in california and new york and london than, exactly. it, than it is in places outside there you don't have to go to the developing world for that you just got to get out of a tech hot button city right right exactly well it's the same thing with things like literacy like there's enormous literacy problems in the u.s yeah. right but they're in certain like primarily in certain regions of the u.s um it's a, and I think it's the same thing with tech literacy or, or the, the the pressure to be accepted in your peer group from a tech perspective. So uh, I suspect the, that, then, that I mean on that point. I mean again, I agree with you, but I think the degree of tech literacy you need is much less than a lot of people in our industry would like it to be. You know, fine, you don't know how to use half the stuff on your smartphone, but, I mean, my my parents don't particularly, but they don't care. It does what they want. So if you deliver brand new features, they wouldn't even notice them. Right. I mean, my mum, literally this week, I think, um, got a message from her her phone operator um, saying, hey, your contract's up in six months, but we'll let you upgrade now if you want to early without paying an early redemption fee. And she sent the email to me and said, should I do this? And I said, what do you want that your phone doesn't do? And she said, nothing. (laughs) And I said, no, there's, there's literally, she's got a Samsung Galaxy A3, the 2017 edition. And I actually can't think of anything she would get out of getting a newer phone. Nothing. Right. Apart from the the, the only reason, I mean, the only reason I would upgrade my phone, my um, Z5 compact is because the battery life is now shocking on it, but that's not because a new phone's better. It's just planned obsolescence again. (laughs) Well, and that's, but that, that's the thing. If, I think if you look at most industries, and I'm not a capitalist, so I, you know, I'm not an expert in this, but if, from what I can tell in most industries, when, when um, a, 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 a something that was an exciting feature becomes the norm, prices tend to go down, right? More and more people want access to it. People start competing on price more and more. I think what we've seen in the last few years of, of phones, and this, I'm going to go back to the notch thing again, is there's so little to talk about yeah. The people obsess over stupid shit, such as notches. And Man, that notch to me, really what's going to happen? Your gears. I just think it's so stupid. It's just like, it's such a non-issue. It's emblematic, I think. Yes. Yeah. It is. It's just like this obsession over it is ridiculous. And I think... In, in, and I think it's because, and you know, a lot of people are going to disagree with me and, and the people are going to care deeply about it. And that's fine. Go knock it out. But I just think there are more important things we should be thinking about. Pho- and I, but yeah. I think it's... Phones are not now like the latest fashion thing. They're like car insurance. You've got to have it. And everyone spends some time choosing the one that they want. And there will be people out there on forums on the internet furiously arguing and breaking friendships over which car insurance company you pick. But most people just go... Or whatever, that one, because it's blue. And then forget about right. it for the rest of the year. <laughs> well, the thing is, as well, is phone people who are, like, hardcore phone fanatics, right? The kind of people who hang out on the XDA forums and places like that. Oh, that's right? okay. I thought we were talking about Jeremy. <laughs> <laughs> right. You know, I, I get, like, if you're really into phones, you're going to have a lot of opinions about a notch. And that's fine. Knock yourself out. Enjoy yourself. Go for it, right? In the same way that hardcore musicians will obsess over the minute differences between specific types of guitar string, yeah. right? I was just going to use guitar strings as the example. That's totally right. Right. <laughs> But the thing is, is that this is bled into the general... I think this is bled into, like, the general, like, consumer tech p- people. Like, a lot of YouTubers who review phones, um, you know, general tech websites will talk about this. Uh, so I, I, you know, to me, like the pricing has got to go down and they, and these companies have got to be able to get access to markets where people just don't have enough phones. And there's a lot of markets out there. People just don't have phones. Right. And it's not just the tech companies. It's going to be the carriers and everybody else. So yeah, yeah, um, totally. Should we squeeze, uh, another one in? Yep. 
Um, we'll do one more. Um, uh, I've got a stupid one just because it, <laughs> Let's do it. it, it amused me. Um, the patent office, this is the US patent office, um, recently awarded a patent um, to someone basically for using maths to prove things. And not a specific example of that, awarded a patent on the idea of using maths to prove things, <laughs> essentially. Hang on, I'm confused. Ex- explain this. Right. I don't understand what so, you're talking about. what you've got here is um, there's a company, and I've got to, and I've got to look up their name, so bear with me, uh, Aesthetic Integration Limited. Have you... <laughs> have, <laughs> okay, <laughs> they sound legit. <laughs> well, um... I, I, I think they might actually be doing something... They're a subset of massive value corporation. <laughs> <laughs> Shush, Jonathan Bacon, right? <laughs> carry on, um, sorry, carry on. Um, Fucking not. Have you, have you come across the idea of formal verification of programmes? It's a very kind of academic thing where you can actually sit down no. and formally prove with maths what a programme will do. Right, yeah. uh, it, 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 I'd say it's a very academic thing. It never really gets out into the world because it only works on kind of toy programs. It's the sort of thing you learn as part of a computer science degree or computer science doctorate, and there are people studying oh, this see. sort of thing. But no one actually does right. formal verification out in the real world. It's the sort of thing that shows up in Knus, the you know, the art, the art of computer programming or whatever. Anyway, yeah. so you you can prove that a program is software free. I don't know, it's software free. It's error free. <laughs> um, right. If you use these formal verification techniques, they've been around since the seventies. No problem. Um, one company has now put together a patent to say the idea of using formal verification on a, on computer trading software, the concept of doing that at all is now patented by them. They're not just using formal verification on a computer trading system. The idea of doing that is now there. So no one else can even try to do that now because they own the patent on it. That's stupid. <laughs> it, it, it doesn't seem right. Um, I mean, we, we have spoken in the past about patents and the patent office and their stupid. We're fans. Yeah, and, we're big yeah. fans of software and, fans. And, and, yeah. and they're stupid. But to me, this is just... Who I, I don't get how they could even sign this off. You know, they, they, they're doing some complicated work over there, but the idea of the whole field, which includes your complicated work, ought not to be a thing where you can go, no one else could use this for 18 years. Right. What I mean, is there anything that can be done about this at all? I mean, we've been complaining about this for... As long as I've but, known Jono, we've been annoyed about the patent industry as it applies I mean, to aside software. from software patent reform? Yeah. I, probably not. Yeah, I just, I don't know. This just seems like another example of this rampant stupidity. This is what I said. It's a, it, it's a stupid thing. It wasn't some kind of big shake-up. We already know this happens. It just seemed like a particularly egregious case to me. <laughs> What I'm curious about is is uh, yeah, and and I think a lot of this is the world that again that we exist in, right? So as open source people, the software patents are not particularly popular with a lot of software open source people, right. um, and you only have to go to the research office of a large company, and you'll see patent certificates on the walls, and they take a great degree of pride in their patents, right? It's very important to them. So obviously that's a world that's that's a little different, but I'd love to be able to see a like an actual informed debate between pro patent people and um, anti patent people in the software world. Like, where does that happen, right? Because I see things like this, which you you know you the the link that you've got here is on the E Electronic Foundation FF website, <laughs> according to their logo. <laughs> um, uh, you know, so the EFF oh, yeah. are obviously... Electronic uh, <laughs> e Electronic <laughs> Foundation FF. That is what it says. Chris Waddle. That, that, that is, in fact, stupid. I hadn't seen that, but yes. F, 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 Chris Waddle. Uh, so, um, yeah, the, uh, you know, the, obviously the EFF are, are, are against this sort of thing. So, um, but I'd like to be able to see, like, some people sit down and have a debate about this, because I just don't feel like I understand the other viewpoint. Like, I, my, as long as I've known you, Mr. Language, I've thought this is silly, but 
I, I, I think I've just assumed it's silly and I've stuck with that viewpoint for a long period of time, but I haven't really heard cogent arguments from the other side. Where do we find that? It's, I think it would be hard to put that together in a way that the participants weren't disingenuous. Right. Um, because if you, have, if you have a sensible reasoned debate, what you end up with is everyone going, OK, maybe some patents on some software is actually not a bad idea, but there shouldn't be these egregious abuses of it, which mean that no one can play MP3s for 20 years or whatever. Um, and, yeah. and everyone sensible on both sides kind of agrees on that, but the patent office don't have to listen to them. And right. if you don't have that kind of debate, which is a regression towards the middle, then what you get is two people trying to set one another on fire, one of whom for destroying everything about money, and the other ones of whom are destroying everything about software. You know, it's... Yeah, no, that's that's fair. Well, I'm holding it in to... I'm holding in my... I'm very ranty today. I don't know what's going on. Because <laughs> our discourse is suffering from this. So. Pick, 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 um, pick, pick something else to rant about, Jeremy. We've got time for one more, I think. Uh, we can end on another light note. Did you see the NHS told, was told to ditch its quote-unquote absurd fax machines? Yes. <laughs> no. Go on. I, I'm, I'm of two minds of this. So it's uh, the NHS will be banning from... Well, uh, BBC, you, you need a copy editor. Uh, the, the NHS is banning buying fax machines starting next month and has been told by the government to phase out the machines entirely by 31 March 2020. So it says right now they have roughly 9,000 fax machines across the NHS, um, and they're hoping to move this to email. And it's interesting to see both sides internally debate this because... Uh, obviously, fax machines are a fairly old technology, and some people think it's absurd that they still have them. And there is a legitimate security issue with them, and that a lot of times you fax things to a fax machine, and then very confidential information is on a piece of paper randomly within an office somewhere. If you dialed the right number, you might have dialed an incorrect number, and then there's some random person has that confidential information. On the other side, it does mean that it's not online, so it's in that way more secure. And their point was a few years ago, they had a large outage at the NHS. The only places that could function were places with fax machines. So there's like a very real debate in 2018 yeah, uh, yeah. about whether faxes should end or should not end. And for some reason, this amused me. The big, out, there's, the there's big also... outage was WannaCry. Remember the ransomware thing? That was oh, one of really? them, yes. They, they, the article went over a couple, or multiple articles I saw went over one of them. I think the BBC article was WannaCry, yes. Yeah. Well, the other thing as well is the, the training required for this. Like, this is one of the things I've discovered from working with different companies. Is I work with some clients who um, are not got anything to do with tech, like people in construction, whatever. And uh, a lot of people, like, email is something that's relatively infrequently used, and faxes are very frequently used. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah. that you'd have to train a shit ton of people it, to, to, to switch over the email the, the, and the, all the regulation. The flip side of that is, um, as time goes on, the, uh, you're getting new people into the workforce who have no idea what a fax machine is. I mean, they're, <laughs> they're, 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 yeah. people, they're people being quoted in these articles saying, um, you know, these things are terrible and it's all incredibly outdated technology and I don't get it and so on. And the impression I get, the vibe I'm getting from them is they're like, what the hell is this ancient technology? It'd be like us having floppy disks for stuff in our, in jobs that we started in 2005 or whatever. You know, it's right, the yeah. previous generation's technology, and there's a certain amount of contempt there, and they're right about that, to be honest with you. The, yeah. uh, the other thing which feeds into this debate is quite a lot of people who are there saying, this is incredibly outdated technology and it should be fixed immediately and swept away with a broom in order that we could bring in the new stuff. Their second sentence is then, and you should buy our secure communications medical system for the low, low price of only $250,000 per se, right? Yeah. So <laughs> um, there, are, right. there are a lot of people who are, again, being disingenuous about this because the reason they want, to, uh, they want it to go away is because they want the contract because the NHS is an enormous employer. <laughs> Yeah. Yes. Yes. If you if you score a deal to get rid of fax machines in the NHS and replace them with some half baked, half written, appalling, unsupported sub email system that you've written in Java, you'll get so much money for doing it. Right. So I fear the sort of technology it will get replaced with 
Because you can, ima- you can imagine a world where it would get replaced with really neat, neat, great things, but I can also imagine a thing where they get stuck in the equivalent of Lotus Notes for the next 30 years because that's what the contract process threw up. Yeah. Zip drives. Yeah, exactly. Zip drives are the solution. <laughs> <laughs> Just people mailing zip drives, like years ago when... Usenet was mailed in a tape to Australia or whatever. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, and, and critically, I'm more of a fan just, of jazz don't... drives, but if you want to go zip, then fine. Well, this is it. You don't, you, you don't uh, and you don't just mail the disc. You mail the disc and then a separate envelope. You mail a drive so they can read it. <laughs> <laughs> and everyone's By like, way, I was "How like... do I even plug this in? I haven't even got a parallel port, have I? Where does it go?" <laughs> <laughs> I can't remember if I said this on Bad Voltage, but I was actually when I was flying over to England from my school reunion, and I saw Mr. Langridge over there. Yay! I was, I was leaning. I was stood, like, near the, near the kind of the door of the aeroplane. I was just stretching my legs near where the loos are. And I just noticed, uh, like, there's a screen on the wall, this old-school kind of EGA-type screen, and there was a three-and-a-half-inch floppy disk slot on the side of it. Really? It's like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this, is a, this is an aeroplane. But one of the things I learned as well is the reason why they still have, little bonus fact, the reason why they have the um, ashtray still in airplanes is because every single thing on an airplane has to have a redundancy um, have, have redundancy built into it, right? So they say smoking is banned on planes, you can't smoke. But if they're in a situation where somebody ignores all of those warnings and they spark up and they need some way, some way of putting out the cigarette, that's the reason why they still have ashtrays on there. Uh, it's because it's the only way, of, it's the only redundant option. That, that would be one of the reasons. The other reason is most of the planes you fly on were bought or ancient way right. before. Yeah, I mean, people are still flying planes around which were built in like 1975 or whatever. Planes have got an incredibly long lo- flying lifespan. I suspect the one with the floppy disk drive, and it's one of those. <laughs> 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 I, I, I'm, I'm assuming you weren't on an A380 or whatever, you know, some brand new Wizzy Dreamliner yeah. which they built last year. Well, I, I normally fly private most of the time. But, but, you, uh, but was, you, was, you, you can tell you know. how old your plane is by just <laughs> by just how um, just how old a version of Red Hat Linux its entertainment system is running <laughs> for, for yeah. when it crashes in the middle and shows you a little tux. You know? I was on a United flight not that long ago that was Red Hat 7.3. <laughs> really? Yeah. This is wow. it. And you're like, I've literally got children younger than this. This is ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it's time. It's time we wrap this up. Thank you, um, uh, thank you, everybody for listening. Thank you, Jeremy, for you know coming back and not leaving us. <laughs> yes, uh, we, we appreciate it. Um, the next show would, in theory, have been being recorded on Christmas Day, so we're not doing that. Um, no. So uh, screw you, people. Yeah, yeah. The, 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 <laughs> the, the, the hell with that. Even my family aren't so bad that um, I'd rather spend time with the bad voltage listenership. So <laughs> are you sure? Are you sure your mum and dad are not like? No, seriously, it's okay. It's okay. You need more. Time just to go, go record, record your show. Just go, just go record the show. That's it. No, I'm, I'm actually very much looking forward to seeing my daughter. You cheeky gits. So <laughs> shut up. Is what you can do. Um, but yeah. So we will be back in the new year. Uh, yes. Probably the uh, f- first or second week. I forget. I forget exactly how the days work out. But yes. yes. Are, you, are you doing are gonna, anything oh. cool in between now and then? Uh, the usual on, on our side. You know. Pies and mead and whatever people do it in the, the, the bacon Christmas household. But uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to taking a bit of time off. It's been a long, been a long year. So, how about you, Jeremy? Yeah, nothing, uh, nothing too big planned. I don't think I, I did. They, a dog allow you to celebrate? I concur with that uh, assessment. Did they give you it's been any a, time off? Been a long year. He, 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 he can celebrate as much as he likes. Just every time he has a mince pie, it shows up on a chart somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but, All right. But yeah, so we're back in the new year, um, and we're going to take a look at our predictions from last year. I think. <laughs> well, yeah, I, I always look forward to this show. It's uh, always entertaining. See just how wrong we got it, right? Yes. So have a very, have a um, uh, have a very good Christmas if you celebrate it. Have a very good New Year whether you celebrate it or not. And right. We'll see you'll you have in a 20... good new year and you'll like it, says Stuart Langridge. Yes, absolutely. Just <laughs> think of all that beer that isn't being drunk. So yes, and we and we will see you in 2019. We will. Bye. <laughs>